welcome back to my channel. I hope you've all been happy, amazing, and positive. So today I'm bringing you guys another true crime case, and this is a case that you've most likely heard of, and it's the Andrea Yates case. This case is super, super sensitive and discusses a lot of things like mental health, postpartum depression, and things of that nature that is quite serious. I know there's a lot of awareness around mental health. I just feel like there, there can never be enough awareness about things like this. Usually when I do my true crime cases, I like to give a lot of my input and opinions. But with this case, because it's so sensitive and because it involves the death of children, I feel like I shouldn't um, give too much of my opinion. And if you are discussing in the comments below, just please try and keep it as respectful as possible possible. Postpartum depression is so real, so common. And I just feel like with things like this, you know, unless you have it, we shouldn't really be putting our opinion or anything like that about it if we don't know what it's truly like. When this crime happened, postpartum depression was not really, people weren't educated on it much. Even psychiatrists back then, we're talking 20, more than 20 years ago, uh, postpartum depression wasn't really in our education system. People didn't really understand it um, as much as they do now. And now, thankfully, we have help at our fingertips, which makes mental health easier to understand. I just want to give my usual disclaimer that all pieces of information that I found on this video and on this case, I found through articles on the internet, YouTube videos, documentaries, things of that nature. So I do understand that not every single piece of information will be 100% accurate, but I've tried my best to provide as accurate information as possible. And another warning, this is a trigger warning. This case does involve a lot of gruesome details. It does discuss the death of children and mental health and things of that nature. So if that's really not your thing, please click out of this video. I have a lot more lighthearted content that you could watch. Andrea Yates was born on July the 2nd in 1964 in a place called Hallsville in Texas. Her parents were Irish and German, so that made Andrea part Irish and part German. She was part of a middle class family, just an average working family. Her father was an auto shop teacher and her mother was a homemaker. She was raised in a Catholic family. She had five siblings and Andrea was the youngest sibling. Andrea was known to be a sweet, sweet girl. She was a giver. She just loved to help people. She really was pretty devoted to her parents. She was always wanting to help other people out. Um, elderly people in the neighborhood it just derived a lot of satisfaction out of, out of wanting to do things for other people instead of people doing things for her. She was a people pleaser. She strived to be the best daughter that she could possibly be. Andrea did not settle for less. She was always a high achiever. Even in school, she was so intelligent she was so bright. She was so smart. She went to Milby High School and graduated in 1982 as the top student in her graduating class. She was also captain of the swim team and everyone just knew her to be this smart, really high achiever. Despite Andrea being such a bright and intelligent student, inside she was hiding a really deep and dark secret. She was battling with a lot of mental health issues. And the thing with Andrea was that if she had something that she was dealing with, she wouldn't even provide the slightest hint that something was wrong. She was so good at suppressing what was really going on. She was so good at hiding things. Andrew was battling depression and she also had an eating disorder. She dealt with mental health issues from a really young age and progressively over the years, it would come back on and off and sometimes it would get really bad and sometimes she could find that she could handle it. And she often expressed to her friends that she was having suicidal tendencies and her friends tried to support her as best as they could. During Andrea's college years, her mental health seemed to be a little better than before. She was studying subjects that she loved and she was just getting by college seemingly okay. After high school, Andrea was studying at the University of Houston and the University of Texas School of Nursing and she absolutely loved 
nursing. Like I said, she was such a giver. She loved helping people. So nursing was like the perfect career choice for her. Then she went off to work as a qualified nurse and she absolutely loved it. In 1989, while Andrea was working as a nurse, she lived in an apartment complex. And in this same apartment complex, she didn't know lived also her future husband called Russell Yates, also known as Rusty. They were both 25 at the time and one day Andrea was in her pool minding her own business. Business. Rusty was sitting by the pool listening to the radio and he was looking at Andrea who was in the pool and he was in awe of this woman. He thought that she was so beautiful, just kept looking at her. But Andrea just completely ignored him. But Rusty was like, she is way too good for me. I don't think I'm even going to approach her. Rusty kind of let it be and he just admired her from a distance. Rusty didn't know that the day that he saw her in the pool was around the time that Andrea was actually suffering from a heartbreak because she had just broken up with someone. Rusty was the popular kid in school. He was a jock. And after school, Rusty went on to study computer systems and how to design them and eventually went on to work for NASA, which especially back then, was huge. Andrea didn't really date that much. You know, she only had this one boyfriend that she did break up with. And she was quite a shy girl. Like, she wasn't the type of person to always put herself out there when it came to guys. But she saw Rusty quite a bit in the apartment complex. And I think they built this kind of acquaintance relationship. And because she kind of started warming up to him, she was the one to approach Rusty. This was a few months after Rusty had seen Andrea in the pool. Rusty found out that Andrea didn't really date much and he was really surprised because he thought she was so beautiful that men would literally be dropping to their knees for her. Andrea and Rusty started dating and they dated for three years before they moved in with one another. They found a passion within their relationship through religion and they prayed together and they read the Bible together. They practiced religion a lot. They found themselves getting really, really close through religion. In 1993, Rusty bought a new home in Friendsville, Texas. And a couple of weeks later, after buying the new home, he and Andrea got married in March. They had a very small and simple wedding ceremony. One thing that was interesting that happened at the wedding, Rusty and Andrea were expressing to the wedding guests that they were not going to use any birth control and that they would have as many kids as God allowed. This was interesting because Andrea expressed to one of her friends that she didn't really enjoy having sex. When she would get dressed, she would dr get dressed in her closet. She was uncomfortable by her body, but they were openly talking about, you know, having kids and not being on birth control. So I, I wondered if it was more of Rusty making that statement. I feel like Andrea with her shy nature wouldn't just openly be like, we're not be gonna be on birth control. That's kind of something that's more private, that's between you and your partner, but I could be wrong. The newlywed couple spent their honeymoon in Cancun and everything seemed perfect. Andrea was so happy, Rusty was so happy. Rusty followed the teaching of a man called Michael Waranecki. Michael Waranecki was a street preacher and his teachings were very extreme and super strict. He almost made a independent religion based on Christianity. God's gonna destroy this earth and all you wretched sinners. We all go to hell. Rusty met this man in college and straight away was heavily influenced by the teachings of Michael Waranecki and started to follow his teachings. Michael Waranecki believed that the men were more dominant, that you should live uh, in a very minimal, very humble lifestyle. He also believed that modern day churches were not true Christianity and also weren't the true way of living. He yelled at female students that they were all going to hell because they were studying and learning in a material world when they should be out there reproducing. And the teachings of Michael Waranecki to hold a job and to even live in a home 
is to participate in the evil satanic conspiracy against God. It was almost a little cultish. He would go around in his bus with his family all over the US to preach. Rusty ended up introducing Michael Waranecki's teachings to Andrea and both of them became heavily, heavily influenced by his teachings and they lived by his teachings as a couple. Andrea Yates and Rusty Yates became close with Michael Waranecki and his family and they stayed in touch through phone calls and letters. Andrea Yates became pregnant with her first child three months after their wedding and gave birth to a baby boy called Noah on February the 1st, 1994. Andrea Yates didn't go to work while she was looking after Noah for the first few months of his life and she was faced with a battle between being a stay-at-home mom or going back to work. People said that she did want to go back to work because she obviously had a strong passion for being a nurse. But Rusty said that him and Andrea talked about it and she pretty much said that she didn't want to go back to work and that she was a mum now and her life was to be with her son and be a good mum to Noah. Rusty said that he gave her the option to go back to work but Andrea said no. I found it interesting that Rusty said that he gave her the option. It was wasn't really his option to give, I guess. I mean, it could have been a discussion, but if she genuinely wanted to go back to work, I think she should have been totally entitled to that. Andrea on the surface seemed like she was enjoying motherhood and adapting really, really well, but her psychiatrist said otherwise. She had thoughts or visions of a knife and had thoughts about stabbing someone in blood. She thought she heard Satan speak to her after the birth of Noah. Andrea Yates kept this a secret because this was something that she felt like she could definitely not tell anyone. And these were the early signs and symptoms of postpartum depression. So because she didn't express this to anyone, it went unnoticed and undiagnosed. Because she seemed great and happy, all the signs and symptoms were not visible to people. Andrea Yates became pregnant with her second son, John, and gave birth in December of 1995. This was quite close to her first newborn as well. And after John was born, this is when she gave up a lot of her activities that she enjoyed. She gave up jogging, swimming, and socializing with her friends. But people around her thought that because she was adapting to, you know, having two kids now, she was busy, that she gave up those things because she simply didn't have the time. But the truth is she gave up those activities because because she felt like her mental health started to really decline. A little bit after John was born, so the next year in 1996, Rusty was offered a new job through his current job in Florida. So the Yates family put their house on rent and moved to Florida. But they didn't move from house to house. Rusty ended up buying a mobile home, so like an RV in Seminole, Florida. So they lived on an RV campground in Florida in this new trailer. And having two young kids in an RV 24 seven, could you imagine how much that would like affect your mental health, especially for someone who is already dealing with mental health issues. This kind of way of lifestyle and way of living was directly through Michael Waranecki's teachings. They were trying to live a more um, minimal lifestyle. It was very brainwashing that, you know, if you live an extravagant or even an average life, lifestyle, it was too much. And of course, living in a mobile home did in fact make Andrea's mental health worse than it already was. In early 1996, Andrea Yates was feeling really, really down. She knew her mental health was getting really, really bad. So she reached out to Michael Waranecki's wife through letter, telling her that she was struggling mentally and she just wasn't feeling right. Michael Waranecki's wife was the one person that Andrea felt like she could be open to and accept advice from. But his wife sent a letter back and it was really, really harsh and super unsupportive. From the letters I have that Rachel Warnecki wrote to Andrea, it was, you are evil, you are wicked, you are a daughter of Eve, who is a wicked witch. And obviously this 
worsened her mental state. She wasn't being cared for or nurtured the way that she was supposed to, especially from a friend. So everything that Michael Waranecki's wife said in the letter, Andrea was believing. Because her mental health was so down, she didn't really have a way of thinking, no, that this is not true. Like she was so involved in their teachings that she completely believed whatever they said. So she really did start believing that she was evil and that she was possessed by the devil and she was going to go to hell and her kids were going to go to hell. In 1997, Rusty's contract ended with that new job and they moved back to Houston. And in Houston, they didn't end up getting a new house. They lived in their trailer still. And as they were living in that trailer, Andrea became pregnant with their third son. Andrea Yates gave birth to her third son, Paul, and they lived together in this trailer. The following year, Rusty saw an ad that Michael Warren Necky had placed selling his bus that he used to travel around the country to preach. Rusty saw this ad and thought it would be a great idea to buy this bus and move his family into this bus from the trailer. And he did end up buying this bus, further cramping them up even more. For Andrea, this was really bad because she didn't have space. She didn't have ways that she could kind of just go into another room and relax for a couple minutes and that sort of thing. She was always cramped up with her kids in this new bus. They ended up selling selling their original house um, because it was on lease. So they ended up selling that and they moved into this bus and yeah, like I said, this would be their permanent home. Noah and John, who were the oldest brothers, they would sleep in the baggage carrier while the others slept in the cabin. Andrea Yates never invited anyone, her family or friends, to the bus. So instead, she would always go over to their house. In 1999, Andrea Yates gave birth to their fourth son called Luke. And this is when her mental health really really started to decline and people started noticing that something was really wrong because remember from that point before she was hiding all these thoughts and hallucinations that she was having apart from the letter that she sent to Michael Waranecki's wife on top of having four kids including a newborn, living in a cramped up bus, having, you know, a decline in her mental health. She had to look after her father who was suffering from Alzheimer's. Even though she was the youngest, she felt like she was the most um, responsible because she was a nurse. So she felt like taking care of him. So she was taking on all this responsibility and it was becoming a lot for her to manage. Four months later in June, Andrea Yates calls Rusty begging him to come home. She sounded really distraught. Rusty was like, is everything okay? Are you okay? And she's like, no, I just need you to come home right now. So he runs from NASA out to the RV park, the 350 square foot bus, walks in and says, what's the matter? Andrea is sitting there chewing her fingers, not biting her fingernails, chewing her fingers. Her legs are trembling, her arms are shaking. She says, I need help. And this was the first time Rusty had seen her like this. So he was obviously super concerned about her and decided to take her for a walk just to calm her down. And once she started feeling a little bit better, Rusty took her to her parents' house and she seemed to have calmed down quite a bit. So even though on the surface level, she seemed to have calmed down, the very next day, things took an even worse turn. Andrea Yates attempted suicide by overdosing on her dad's prescription medication and she was rushed to hospital. So once her physical treatment was all good at the hospital, she was transferred to a psychiatric hospital and that is where she was diagnosed with major depressive disorder. She expressed to the nurse that she was trying to sleep forever by taking those prescription medications but then she felt guilty because she knew she had kids to live for. So at the hospital, the doctors prescribed her medication for her depression. She did not want to take them but eventually gave in and started taking a medication called Zoloft. She met with a few doctors, she did group therapy, she seemed to be doing better, you know her mood was up and down but she seemed to be doing better. So after the week in hospital she was discharged and was given her prescription medication to take. A week later she has an appointment with another doctor who changes her medication to Zyfrexa. 
think that's how you say it. Is that Prexa? I'm not too sure. But Andrea Yates didn't want a bar of it and she flushed it down the toilet. Andrea didn't want to be on medications. For one thing, Reverend Warnecke believes that medicines are bad, that doctors are bad. Because she flushed down the tablets that she was meant to be taking, her condition worsened. She was picking at sores on her nose, scratching bald spots on her head. She was scraping her legs, scratching her legs and arms. And she started to refuse to feed her kids. She claims that there was a day that they were watching cartoons and the devil was speaking to her through these cartoon characters, through the TV, saying that her kids were eating too much candy and that they needed to stop. She thought that this was a message and she was paranoid that there were cameras in the house watching her. And she told Rusty about these thoughts and hallucinations, but nothing really was done. And she said that she envisioned stabbing someone, but she was not specific about who she saw stabbing. I'm thinking she could have been envisioning that she was stabbing one of her kids. But then again, I could be wrong. Because Andrea Yates' family knew that she had major depressive disorder, her side of the family started discussing about how mental health actually ran in the family. Andrea's sister and dad had depression and her brother also had bipolar. The following month in July, Rusty caught Andrea attempting suicide yet again. Rusty walked into Andrea Yates' mother's bathroom Room where he found Andrea with a knife to her neck and Rusty rushed over to her and started wrestling her, attempting to take the knife off her. Andrea was begging Rusty to let her do it. She was attempting suicide because she was scared that she was going to harm her kids and that this started from her firstborn. She was again admitted to the psychiatric hospital and that is where she was finally diagnosed with postpartum depression. The nurses said that Andrea seemed super anxious she wasn't really giving um, eye contact when she was talking or when she was being spoken to. She barely spoke. She was um, frightened. She was paranoid. And she had self-inflicted wounds all over her body. And while she was at this hospital, she was given a emergency shot of a powerful antipsychotic drug called Haldol. After an emergency dose of the antipsychotic drug Haldol, Andrea loosened up and confessed to the doctors that she suffered the knife vision as many as 10 times in several days and feared her visions predicted violence. She was also put on Haldol. That was the one medication that actually seemed to be really helping her. She expressed at the hospital that she admittedly was depressed really badly ever since her firstborn child. At the hospital, she was on and off. You know, she did seem to cooperate. She did speak, seem to speak sometimes, but then she, sometimes she would withdraw and not really talk much. She went to family therapy with Rusty as well. Andrew Yates was discharged from the hospital even though she wasn't better yet. Medical records show that she was released because the insurance had run out. Didn't matter whether she was well or not, but the insurance had run out. Once she was discharged, Andrea Yates' parents said that she really needs to get out of this bus that she was living in and move into a home. And this would hopefully help her uh, mental state. Rusty agreed and bought a three bedroom home. Andrea Yates continued therapy as an outpatient. She said that she regretted the suicide attempt and that she felt a lot better after moving from the bus to the home. And she claimed that the kids were a little detached from her because of how much she was kind of going to the hospital. Rusty starts to pressure Andrea to get out of the treatment, saying that she was 90 to 95% back to normal. He told the doctors that um, there was going to be ease to some stress for Andrea because his mum would come over to help Andrea with the kids and he was only going to start working half days. But Andrea's stress would still be there because she had the pressure of homeschooling her kids as well. Andrea tells her doctor that she wants to get off her medication because she wants to have more kids. And her doctor really advises her against having any more children because it could trigger another psychotic episode. But Andrea did not listen. Despite not taking her medication, she was doing quite well. She started doing some of her activities that she enjoyed doing. And in December, the doctor takes her off Haldol, which was the one medication that was helping that she did take from time to time. The doctor told her to continue her other medication that she was also prescribed with, but she did if you're on medication and you come on and off of it a lot, we think that it does something to your brain and then if you get sick, 
you often get sicker. And then it becomes harder to treat the second, third, fourth time. So in March of the year 2000, she gets pregnant with her fifth child, Mary, despite the doctors telling her to not have any more children. Mary was born in November and sadly in the following year in 2001, Andrea Yates' father passes away. This caused Andrea to spiral again and she deteriorated really, really fast. She stopped drinking liquids. She refused to feed her kids. She was scratching and picking at her scalp again and starts to not really talk much either. She was admitted to the facility again as an inpatient so she would stay at the hospital and the doctor said that she almost seemed as though she was catatonic. She starts her therapy and she does talk in her therapy sessions. However, when she's asked about does she still think of suicide, she stops talking again. After a couple of weeks, her condition does seem to improve. Then she's discharged as an inpatient patient and is placed on a partial hospitalization care. This meant that she goes into the hospital for the therapy, but then she has to come home at night. She goes for one day and then refuses to go again. Rusty said that he supported her decision to not go back, but the doctors were saying that she really needs to come back and was really encouraging her to come back. But Rusty said that he could take care of her at home. So on May 3rd, 2001, Noah, who was Andrea Yates' firstborn, sees Andrea filling a bathtub. And he goes to tell Rusty's mom, who was visiting that day, to help Andrea take care of the kids. So Rusty's mom enters the bathroom and asks Andrea why she's filling up the bathtub. And Andrea replies with, just in case I need it, which did not sit right with Rusty's mom at all. You know, usually if you were running a bath for the kids, you would say, oh, just filling up the tub for, um, you know, the kids' bathing time. So obviously Rusty and his mom got concerned again and is taken to the psychiatric hospital once again. In the hospital, Andrea denies having any hallucinations or anything like that. She claimed to say that she was fine. Andrea was denying any suicidal thoughts. Rusty said, you know, can she go back on Haldol? So um, she gets placed back on Haldol. And this was after Rusty refused Andrea to go um, and have electroshock therapy. On May 14th, despite her not being fully better, she was discharged because she said that she wasn't having any suicidal thoughts anymore. So the doctor was like, okay, she's not a suicidal patient. We can discharge her. Rusty was really shocked as to why she was being discharged. He thought that she did still need help, but she said that she could be discharged and placed um, in partial hospitalization again. And the doctors agreed. I feel like Rusty shouldn't have told her to get out of therapy beforehand. He forced her to get out of it saying that she's 90 to 95 percent back to herself but she really wasn't. So Andrea started partial hospitalization again and was released three days early because she seemed to be doing well but then the doctors took her off Haldol again. 12 days later Andrea has a follow-up appointment with the doctor and the doctor asks how she's going and Rusty says she's not improving, she's having nightmares, she's just not doing too well and again Rusty's like can she be placed on Haldol? Rusty hesitated to question the doctor. You know if I were to challenge him and say well this medicine worked for her in 99 why aren't we trying it now? I'm confident this will work you know and and kind of looks back to his you know diploma on the wall. And the doctor was like, no, Haldol isn't a great medication to be on and refuses to put her back on Haldol. The doctor turns to Andrea and goes, Andrea, you have to think happy thoughts as if that's just going to fix everything. On top of taking her off Haldol, the doctors reduced her dosage of the other medications that she was on as well, despite Rusty saying that she's not doing well. And then allegedly the doctor writes in his doctor's note that Andrea's doing well when she absolutely wasn't. The day before the murders, Andrea seemed to be doing okay. You know, she was playing basketball with her family. She was watching cartoons with the kids. She seemed to be having a fun night when out of nowhere without her even saying anything to anyone she just goes upstairs to bed straight away she doesn't even change her clothes she just goes to bed so the next day on june 20th when rusty and andrea woke up rusty noticed that andrea was acting a little strange she was acting a little nervous but he just thought that she was having one of those off days again and made sure that andrea took her medication before he left to go to work rusty's mom was scared 
scheduled to come to the house an hour later after Rusty left to help Andrea. So Andrea knew she only had one hour to do the most heartbreaking thing that a mother could possibly do. After Rusty left to go to work, Andrea fed the kids. While the kids were eating, Andrea filled the bathtub with cold water. When the bathtub was full, she guided Paul to the bathroom. She drowned Paul took his lifeless body and placed it on the bed. And then she covered his body and went to get the next son. She did exactly the same thing to some of the other kids as well. Then she went on to baby Mary, where she drowned baby Mary as well, and left her body floating in the water in the bathtub. Then Andrew went to get the last son that she was going to do this to, Noah. When Noah came to the bathroom, he saw Mary floating in in the water and asked Andrea why she was floating in the water. His instincts rolled in and he turned around to run away from Andrea but he wasn't fast enough as Andrea caught up to him and grabbed him and he was screaming trying to fight her off and she starts drowning him as well. Noah put up a fight like he really tried to fight his mother off and he managed to come up from the water twice before he had no more energy to fight anymore and he tragically passed away. Andrea left Noah's body in the bath but she took Mary's body out and placed her in the bed as well next to her brothers and after she did this she immediately called 911. You have a disturbance? Are you ill or what? Uh, yes, I'm ill. You need an ambulance? No, I need a police officer. What's the problem? Um... She seemed so calm in the 911 call, like it almost seemed eerie. Like it's like she was completely numb. After she called 911, she immediately called Rusty. I was worried because I'm like, well, Andrea called me with a firm tone, said I needed to come home, and so I did. Police were there in my yard. I wanted to go inside. They wouldn't let me inside. They told me what happened. And uh you know, I just, I remember laying in the grass and just bawling. He fell to the ground and he's like, wow, you finally did it, Andrea. How could you do this? She just sat there and just stared at the door with this blank look on her face. It was just like void of anything. When two police officers arrived at the house, Andrea confessed to her crimes. The police showed up at her door said, what's the problem? She said, I killed my children. Andrea is then arrested at her home and is charged with murder. This sparked international outrage. People were divided. Some people felt sympathy and empathy for her and felt really, really bad for her. But then some people, you know, thought she was evil and horrible and she deserved to have the death penalty. Like, you know, they just couldn't see a way around this. But surprisingly, Rusty spoke to the press straight away. The next day, Day, wow. Rusty shocked everyone. You know, I'm supportive of her. It's hard, you know, like I said, because you know, I'm torn. One one side of me blames her because she, you know, she did it, you know. But the other side of me says, well, she didn't because that wasn't her, you know. She she wasn't in the right frame of mind, and I guess she had, you know, psychotic, you know, side effects with her depression that, that led her to do this. He was obviously still very devastated, but it just struck me as very interesting as how he was so calm and was so able to speak so confidently in front of the press. He was smiling and you know just speaking really well and I mean I guess you know grief is different for everybody. On the 27th of June the kids are laid to rest. Their father Rusty did provide their eulogy. All while this is happening you know the media outrage and the public outrage. Andrea has been taken to the psychiatric hospital to get psychiatric tests done and things like that. She was placed on um, medication and she was being interviewed. Some of the interviews which were recorded. When I saw her in the jail that first time, I would ask her questions and she would answer it in nonsense. After you drew the bath water, what was your intent? What were you about to do? And the children. She claimed that she had Satan in her and the, and Satan was out to get her kids. She believed that she had the markings of the devil on her head, on her scalp, um, saying 666. She also said that she saw the devil um, on the walls in her jail cell. She was also talking about her kids and saying that if you weren't able to raise your kids to be perfect, you should just 
kill yourself. And this came directly from Michael Waranecki's teachings. Her phrases and the choice of words that she would say were directly from what Michael Waranecki would say. It's better to tie a stone around your neck and throw yourself in this sea than to cause a little one to stumble. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it is better for him that a heavy millstone be hung around his neck and he be drowned in the depth of the sea. I mean, Jesus, you're saying to kill yourself? Yeah. Once she became psychotic, it tied in with her religious beliefs at the time. So for Andrea's trial, the defense had to prove that Andrea committed these crimes within the reason of insanity. But in the state of Texas, that reason is really, really hardly successful in the courtroom and is only used successfully in less than 1% of cases. So you can imagine, like, it's really hard to prove reason of insanity. And the state was gathering evidence to prove that she was actually sane during the time of the crime, public opinion was completely divided. Some people believed that she um, absolutely was not in the right frame of mind and some people believed that she was just pure evil. The defense said that during the time when Andrea committed the crimes, you could tell that she was completely not in a normal state of mind, but her confession was not recorded. The defense said that if she was recorded when the crimes were committed, it would prove to the jury that she was not in the right frame of mind. But when she was being interviewed months and even weeks weeks later after the crime was committed, she was full of medication, so she seemed much more in a better mind frame. When the jury was watching these interviews, she seemed normal. She was talking and whatnot. She was cooperating with the answers um, to the questions and stuff like that. So the jury were not convinced for the reason of insanity. Therefore, it made it really hard for the defense to prove that she was insane during the time of the crime. For his Satan with ruin my children for his for himself. There was even a mock trial, like an acting trial, where the defense used their strategies to prove that she was insane during the time of the crime. But even the mock jury were not convinced. So they were just thinking about how they were going to prove to the real jury that she was in fact insane during the time of the crime. The mock jury could not wrap their heads around the fact that she had killed her kids. Like that was the only thing that was popping up into their mind. And that's why they just couldn't even think of the fact that Andrea was insane. She, they just thought, there's no way, she needs to be locked up. The state kept their argument very simple, very, you know, black and white, and they argued that she planned the murders. She waited for that time where she was alone to carry the murders, and that it was completely thought out, and the state said that that should be enough to convict her. So after three and a half hours of deliberation from the jury, We, the jury, find the defendant, Andrea P. A. Yates, guilty of capital murder as charged in the indictment. Andrea faced the death penalty by lethal injection or she was faced with life imprisonment and the jury did deliberate on that also and within 40 minutes of deliberation they decided to spare Andrea's life and give her the life imprisonment sentence. Andrea Yates family and friends felt really really sorry for her you know they believed that she she really was sick and that she did need more therapy. Andrea and Rusty did get divorced and Rusty is now married to someone else. I feel like a lot of people, including Andrea's doctors, did fail her. You know, she was in need of intensive care and her going in and out and not being watched while she was taking her medication and just all of that. I just feel like people really did fail her and, you know, moving her into a trailer, a bus, a house, it just was not helping her at all. And on top of that, you know, they're practicing the teachings of Michael Waranecki. I honestly feel like his teachings was one of the reasons of her mental decline as well and you know how scared she was and how much she started incorporating her religion with the devil and being scared and that sort of thing. And I feel like Michael Waranecki's teachings were so apparent in her life, in her day-to-day -day life.
Three, the jury find the defendant, Andrea Pia Yates, not guilty by reason of insanity. Anyway, that's all I have for you guys today. I know this was a super intense case, a lot to take in, but thank you so, so much for watching. Please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and leave a comment down below on what you think about this case, and do you feel like more could have been done for Andrea, and also please leave some suggestions of some other cases that you would like to see me do. Please stay happy, please stay amazing, please stay positive, and I'll catch you next time. Bye!